Now a long way after Archimedes, uh, a very long way after Archimedes, came a gentleman called Samuel Plimsoll. Now he's responsible for one of the more interesting uh, stories of historical context, I guess, with regards to flotation in the 1870s. Fairly recent history when you think about it. Samuel Plimsoll was a member of parliament in Britain during a time when so-called coffin ships were being sent to sea all the time with unsuspecting crews. Quite often, in fact for a period of about 30 years, ship owners, rather than break up their worn out old ships, they often would repaint them, rename them, claim them to be a new ship and sign on crews. Crews who would go aboard to sail on those ships and seeing the condition uh, would often refuse to sail. Now back in those days, before they had any real rights, they were tried in court for this refusal. So it was a uh, this gentleman who in Parliament devoted his life to trying to reform this big problem in the maritime industry where ships were worth more to their owners sunk than they were to arriving at their destination. These ships were heavily insured. Interestingly, as recently as 1977, someone tried to do the same thing with a cargo ship crossing the Indian Ocean, planted a time bomb on it, and the time bomb went off, the loss of six lives, the ship sunk, uh, the whole intention was to claim insurance on that cargo, which apparently was made up of the remains of a, a nuclear facility or a nuclear plant, but in fact it was just full of scrap metal. So they tried to pull the same trick, but uh, the instigator of that particular incident came unstuck. But that was 1977. The concept was the same thing. So Samuel Plimsoll eventually managed to get through Parliament the concept of a line to be drawn on the side of a vessel um, above which the ship could not be sunk down with cargo. It was all a matter of reserve buoyancy, keeping that reserve buoyancy so that the ship had some semblance of stability, some ability to remain upright. Because prior to that, these coffin ships were being loaded to literally within an inch of their lives, that much freeboard to cross an ocean with. Now the load line has come a very long way since uh, Plimsoll's time and is now the subject of its own International Maritime Organisation Convention, a convention that's acted, uh, enacted here in Australia, along with probably just about every other maritime nation of the world. In Australia, every vessel over 24 metres must have a load line unless it's a fishing vessel or it's a vessel that only carries passengers in uh, smooth or partially smooth waters, that's operational areas D and E. If you don't have a load line and you're over 24 metres, you must have what's called a load line exemption certificate. Details of all that stuff can be found on the AMSA website. A load line on a ship is commonly found near midships. If our little vessel here happened to have one, that's pretty much where you'd find it. As close as possible to midships. On either side of the vessel too, of course. Let's look at it very basically. We won't go into too many details about this at this point. But just to give you some idea, as we look at all of these letters, they are basically indicating what's known as seasonal zones around the world. They are areas in which ships may operate and can only sail under certain loading conditions or certain drafts according to the weather that can be expected in those areas. So down here, for example, at the extreme end is winter North Atlantic pretty harsh conditions, lots of big scary waves. We want as much reserve buoyancy in that sort of area as we can we can feasibly have whilst keeping the economy of the ship making sure we can still carry enough cargo to make the vessel worthwhile to make the journey worthwhile above that we have winter then we have summer and the summer line is located where the plimsoll mark over here is located so i'm just going to draw a little bit of a line through there to indicate that this is actually where the vessel's designed water line sometimes known as summer draft or summer water line is above that tropical. Obviously we've gone from pretty rough conditions to relatively benign conditions and you can see that legally we can have less reserve buoyancy the calmer the conditions. This is the salt water side of the load line. Over here we have the fresh water side. This one stands for fresh and this stands for tropical fresh and the vessel can be sunk down even further under those conditions. Now these are actually welded onto the side of a ship. We, again, we won't get into too much detail about that, but just basically this is about a foot long and they're about an inch wide. It's metal and it's obviously affixed to the side of the ship. It's put there before the ship's even launched. When the ship floats on her summer line, the difference 
between the summer draft and the freshwater draft here is known as FWA or freshwater allowance. What that means is that if you load the vessel right up a long river where the water is actually fresh at that particular port, the ship will obviously be floating here and you're allowed to load the ship to the top of the line. As you sail out to sea and you sail through the heads and commence your voyage, your ship will float at the very top edge of the summer line. Again, remember I said those naval architects are pretty clever people. So fresh water allowance. This means you're not, uh, you're not diddled out of any cargo carrying capability just because you're loading in fresh water. You're allowed to load to here. The ship will rise up due to the increased density of salt water as she proceeds to sea. Can you remember in our diagrams before what any draft or any allowance uh, may be called or what the water is called between those two points? It's dock water allowance. You can, of course, measure the density of the water you're floating in at the time, and it might come in somewhere between one up here, density of one, and of course 1.025 down here at the summer draft, and anywhere in between is known as dock water. So anywhere, say here, that could be called the dock water allowance for the density of the water that you're floating in at the time of loading. And there's some mathematics involved, obviously, in determining how much deeper you can sink the boat at that port before proceeding to sea so that you float where you'd like to float on the summer line. If you proceed to sea and you're in breach of the load line convention, your insurance is void, uh, all sorts of ramifications. It's a it's a unseamanlike thing to do. One more line up here, and this is called the deck line. This indicates the position on the outside of the ship of the uppermost continuous watertight deck, the freeboard deck of the ship. And between the summer line and the deck line, therefore, is her statutory freeboard.